from Washington, D.C., this is Middle East Focus. Hello, and welcome to Middle East Focus, a weekly podcast on regional affairs and U.S. policy produced by the Middle East Institute in Washington, D.C. You can subscribe to Middle East Focus on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and other podcast providers. I'm Karen Young. I'm a senior fellow and director of the program on economics and energy at the Middle East Institute. And it's my pleasure today to be joined by Emily Stromquist and Colby Connolly for a discussion on gas developments in the Eastern Mediterranean. Emily Stromquist has over a decade of experience advising corporate and financial services clients on global energy market trends and political risk. She's lived and worked across Europe, Eurasia, and the Middle East and Africa, and currently serves as a managing director at Teneo, the global CEO advisory firm. Colby Connolly joins us as a research analyst at Energy Intelligence, where he works with the firm's research and advisory practices. His key areas of focus include oil and gas LNG markets, above ground risk, corporate strategy, and the impact of the energy transition on oil and gas producing states. And it's such a pleasure because both Emily and Colby are non-resident scholars in our economics and energy program at MEI. So welcome. Thank you so much for being with us. Thanks very much for having us, Karen. So I'd like to set the stage a bit on why there is so much interest right now in gas markets, in the ability to bring on new supply and export capacity particularly from the Eastern Med right now. We can talk about other regions as well. Just in you know the end of April, beginning of May, we've seen the prospect of Russian shifts and cut off of gas supplies to Europe. And this is really you know increasing that sense of vulnerability, particularly in European markets and dependence on gas in Europe. So energy security, of course, a big consideration for you know a lot of governments right now but particularly in Poland and Bulgaria, where Russia cut gas deliveries because they wanted to receive payment in rubles via Gazprom Bank. So the the whole kind of issue of sanctions and the kind of legal export and ability to buy gas is now also kind of on the table. But if we put this into a little bit of pre-Russian invasion of Ukraine context, the natural gas business itself, I think we could say, has been in a great deal of transformation with some new projects coming online and discoveries and you know, some existing kind of tensions and you know, political disagreement on how actually to get gas to market. Should it be via LNG on ships and containers or should it be via new pipelines coming from the Eastern Med and North Africa to Europe. So I'd like to hear a little bit about that. We've also got a conflict brewing between Algeria and Morocco on an existing kind of pipeline that is now not online. So I wonder if we could start with some kind of basic geography and capacity. And maybe if I could ask Emily to kind of set the stage for us, just kind of give us a sense of where traditional gas production has been in the Eastern Med and where some of this new production is. Yeah, sure, Karen. I think just to sort of continue with the Europe theme a bit, that just helps provide some context for the the broader East Med conversation. But, you know, I think especially in light of everything going on, it's really created a lot of awareness about what kind of dependence, not just Europe, but the global market has on Russian gas. You know, Russia supplies over 40% of Europe's gas needs. That's about 155 BCM. And Europe is looking to cut two thirds of that by the end of the year, around 100 BCM. And fully to cut its dependence on Russian gas um, well before 2030. So in order to do this, they've turned to a number of their traditional suppliers, particularly LNG suppliers. So this is the US, Qatar, Azerbaijan by pipeline. But along with that, they've also turned to the East Med. And this is a conversation that's been going on for quite a while. So at the forefront of this are conversations with Egypt and Israel about how much additional gas supply potential there is and, and how quickly it can get to the European market. So traditionally, the East Med has kind of faded in and out depending on market dynamics. So things like climate, geopolitics, gas prices. Traditionally and typically the projects in the East Med are higher cost. So they require really the correct price and demand indicators to justify these kind of multi-decade project horizons. On the demand side, you know, obviously now we're seeing these immediate demand drivers from Europe. But commitments to climate policies remain in Europe. On the flip side of that, the UN IPCC, which you know, Karen, you and I have discussed you know, previously, they have now named East Med as one of the most vulnerable regions for climate change. So it has to be a consideration not just from the EU perspective, but about developing these projects from a regional perspective. On the price side, 
We're currently looking at immense market tightness and, and volatility, and the ensuing competition between Asia and Europe for LNG has really driven up those prices. At the moment, that's really created more justification for developing these higher cost projects in the East Med. But, you know, that creates also a huge if about, you know, what comes after a Ukraine war and will that demand still be there? Will the price indicator still be correct? So against this backdrop, the major projects really span in the East Med from Egypt to Cyprus and Israel. These projects have massive capacity and are actually some of the biggest globally. One of the big ones that I'm sure we'll talk more about is Zor in Egypt. They produced a record 28 BCM last year. So if you kind of think about that in the Russia-Europe context, that would be a, a significant chunk of that supply if that were sort of all, you know, directed toward Europe, which obviously it's not going to be. But, you know, just for context, that's a large amount. There's Leviathan in Israel, which has about 10 BCM available for exports. Tamar also in Israel, which is used to meet domestic power demand in Israel. And then several major fields around Cyprus too, primarily Aphrodite, Calypso, Glaucus. But, you know, one of the big issues, obviously, with Cyprus projects is that you need additional huge investments for production and export infrastructure, plus the added geopolitical risks of working around Turkey. So all said, you know, there's a lot of fields that have already been developed. There's a lot of potential to develop more around those fields. But I think, and, you know, last point on this is that we haven't really seen as much kind of wildcat drilling around these projects in recent years. Most of the majors have favored kind of searching around existing fields where they can capitalize on infrastructure already in place. And that obviously helps kind of streamline costs a bit. So in that respect, we haven't really seen any major new discoveries since 2019. So it's a bit of a holding pattern. And I think, you know, how this develops will depend a lot on these demand and price variables that develop in the market and particularly sort of the trajectory of the Ukraine crisis. Thank you, Emily. That is really, really a good overview of some of the kind of challenges to developing more. And I wanted to ask Colby if you might tell us a little bit more about the Egyptian gas story. I mean, this has been a sort of a banner year. Egypt is a net exporter of, of gas now, but you know, it's a little bit difficult in sort of the landscape of how you get it to new markets. And there've been some problems. Sometimes Egypt has decided not to export when it, you know, could have done and and served more of its own domestic demand. So Colby, what's what's going on there? There are really two critical issues that surround where Egypt fits into this this East Med gas picture. The first of those really is the fact that it's the one country in the region that maintains LNG export capacity or, or liquefaction capacity. But also the second issue here is that it, it kind of forces us to consider the idea of the East Med region itself as being a fairly substantial gas market, not something that is just a producing region. So when we're discussing reserves that are specific to the East Med, there are really three main countries that are important to discuss. And Emily really laid that out perfectly. The three I'm thinking of here are, are Egypt, but also Israel and Cyprus. And at this stage, you know, Egypt is less important for the purposes of the actual incremental supply that it provides than it is for, like I mentioned, the fact that Damietta and Itku are the two cities that it's got on its northern coast that have the region's liquefaction capacity. But in terms of substantial reserves that hold more of the export potential, Israel and really to a lesser extent, Cyprus are the stars of the show here. I don't say that to discount Egypt's reserves. And in fact, Egypt is one of the places we've already seen some early deal activity with an agreement from ENI to boost production at assets that it operates jointly with EGAS, which is a state firm. And that's meant to add 3 billion cubic meters a year to ENI's LNG portfolio. And as we've seen elsewhere, and we can get into later, ENI has been fairly active in trying to secure gas supplies for Europe. But coming back to Egypt for a second, you know, one of the disadvantages it has in terms of being an exporter is, is something that a lot of people who have followed Egypt for a while will be well aware of. And, and that's this sort of energy crisis that it had in the earlier half of the previous decade. And Cairo is fairly hawkish when it comes to taking preventative action in this regard. This is part of what's taken so long in, in some of the majors in the region. Well, I say majors, really Chevron in that sense, to, to determine what it wants to do with export routes from Israel, because Cairo won't really provide guarantees that it won't redirect gas away from its liquefaction terminals to the domestic market, whether that's gas produced in Egypt or that's currently being imported from Israel. You know, there's a precedent for that happening when it ran into these shortages in the earlier 2010s. 
in addition to the fact that there are times when it feels benchmark prices are, are too low and it, it, it just doesn't feel that exports are worth it. Now, that might not be a short term problem here, but it's definitely something that can come up again in the longer term. And, you know, there are concerns about piping gas to, to Egypt that I, th I think in that sense require us to consider what some of the other options might be. And in truth, there really aren't too many. Israel has ruled out construction of LNG export terminals on its own coastline, fairly strong environmental movement there. And that's something that's led Chevron, which is really the main operator in Israel's offshore at this point, to consider floating LNG that could liquefy volumes from those Leviathan and Tamar fields that Emily mentioned earlier which can then be exported anywhere, either to Europe or you know, through the Suez Canal onto Asia without the fear of uh, you know, that sort of intervention coming from Cairo that's caused issues in the past. You know, FLNG was seen as something that was less likely for a time. I, I think that's changed a bit now. There are other options that have sort of emerged for some discussion that I, I think are probably less likely at this point. One of them is new pipeline capacity that would link Israel's offshore assets and then potentially some of those in Cyprus once they're developed to Turkey, which would then leverage the extensive midstream infrastructure that Turkey has to theoretically move volumes onto Europe. The main problem with this project, other than, than its cost and, and maybe some uncertainty over long-term gas demand prospects in Europe, which I think Emily can probably speak better to than I can, is that it would require some long-term diplomatic solutions to issues with disputed maritime boundaries around Cyprus. I would think that Turkey would probably be interested in being a part of the solution here, given some of the diplomatic moves they've made recently. But I'm a lot more skeptical that the Cyprus issue is going to be resolved just for this purpose. You know, I think that's a 50-some-odd year issue. I don't think that'll happen overnight just for, for a new pipeline capacity. Thanks, Colby. And I think, you know, you put on the table a, a really important regional dimension, which is, you know, electricity demand. And that's why Egypt had in the past, you know, really diverted some of its potential gas exports for domestic use. But now they have a huge solar capacity and, and a, a surplus of electricity generation capacity. So, you know, that becomes an interesting regional dynamic as well. Emily, I want to come back to you. And we've mentioned Israel several times here, very large fields discovering new investors and Mubadala, big kind of interest there. Can you shed a little light, you know, what are kind of new partnerships in the Israeli gas sector and how will that get to market? Sure, absolutely. You know, I think just kind of to get back to the last point you were saying about electricity, I would just throw in one other thought there before I touch on the Israel stuff. But, you know, I think this is where you have to think about regional integration and how to sort of make the most cost effective plays in the region and make sort of the most use of collective resources and infrastructure. And I think to your point, this is where the projects like the Euro-Asia and the uh, Africa-Europe interconnectors make a lot of sense because this is making use of regional resources. It's also addressing European intermittency issues with renewables. And so I think these are the kinds of projects that are smart thinking about sort of how to navigate the future. So I think those are two sort of interesting cases that, you know, when the region's kind of thinking about its development and its sort of integration in terms of these gas projects, those are really kind of the models that should be the way of the future. But in terms of Israel... You know, as Colby sort of, you know, rightfully pointed out, one of the issues is obviously just figuring out how to expand the export capacity, what routes that takes, you know, for evacuation and where it goes out of. And obviously, Egyptian LNG has remained one of the attractive options in addition to, you know, the potential for, for floating LNG at these fields and additional exports, you know, via Egypt through new build pipelines or this controversial East Med pipeline is also sort of another prospect out there, although that seems to have lost some steam recently. But, you know, I think there's going to be sort of a bit of a, a wait and see at the moment before, you know, some of these sort of additional resources are, are developed full steam. And that's because companies are going to need to see and assess where is Europe willing to put its money? What is the demand picture looking like in Europe again after the Ukraine war? The Abraham Accords you know, technically opened what should have been new opportunities for Israel. And we did see that, in fact, materialize, you know, the Mubadala deal that you mentioned buying uh, the $1 billion stake in Tamar from NewMed. But, you know, by the same token, Israel's announced planned bid round in January for new offshore gas exploration licenses is now on hold with this new government. They're still reviewing the country's energy needs. And obviously, a large part of that question is what role is gas going to play going forward? So that's also kind of going to be one of the big determining factors in terms of, you know, how much more private investment goes into Israel and, and how much more development of new fields there are. The other big question, I think, really for Israel and, and sort of the future of partnerships is, 
can this gas get to Europe in the next year or two? Because that would really be, you know, what justifies the, the sort of cost profile for these projects. So, you know, I think these are really the signposts that we have to look out for are what is Israel's plan? How are they going to approach the development of these resources? And strategically, how does that fit into their thinking about the country? And then also, what are the EU indicators of their own demand and their interests in regional projects? And sort of what does that in turn imply about, you know, where the opportunities are for Israel? That's fascinating. And, you know, I, I want to talk a little bit, maybe moving westward across the bed, but thinking about, you know, demand and just this real environment of uncertainty that, of course, we're all living in and, you know, thinking about what happens in Ukraine and what happens to Russian energy output in the next, you know, year or two, five years. But how does that fit in, into two kind of situations? So first, the sort of European political context for looking for new gas supply and then thinking about gas as a carbon emitter. But then, you know, how do we think about how Europe might be more connected to North Africa and the Eastern Med in terms of, you know, next generation energy needs and turning that gas into hydrogen, blue and green hydrogen. So I wonder if both of you could help kind of lay the kind of challenges first for, you know, the uncertainty in European demand right now for gas and sort of where the, you know, possible expansion for, you know, receiving more in this short term in this conflict period. For example, you know, the Qataris signed an agreement with the German government to establish maybe to think two new terminals in Germany to receive more gas. Right now we have good capacity, I think, in Spain and the UK, but it's harder to get around Europe. So w- what happens there? And then looking forward to sort of the next generation of gas and iterations of gas, you know, what does that look like? And and do you see then more sort of possible political economic linkages between Europe and what they like to call the Southern neighborhood? So it's a, a lot of questions there, but uh, whoever wants to jump in first on, on either aspect. I can tackle the Europe bit of that first, and then I'll push it over to Colby. I think he has some good insights on the North Africa connectivity part. But, you know, I think on the Europe side, It's a bit of a sort of dilemma at the moment, because obviously what we've seen in this last week where there were announcements that they were starting to shut off supplies to Poland and Bulgaria, you know, after the war continues, that's probably not the end of this. If other countries don't sort of agree to ruble payment terms and the war drags on and there's escalation in Western sanctions, Russia's likely to push the envelope on that and test the waters. So I think the simple answer is that there's not really an overnight solution to boosting European gas imports from elsewhere, whether that's LNG or pipeline, and not to levels that are sufficient enough to offset any of these potential Russian losses, whether sort of elected or actually cut by Russia. So, you know, I think as you pointed out, the bulk of Europe's current LNG import capacity capacity is in the West, in the Iberian Peninsula in particular. These storage terminals, even with the onslaught of the war, have been kind of underutilized. And that's largely because the connectivity just isn't there to move that gas right now kind of beyond immediately to France. And even then, that capacity is quite limited. So getting that to the rest of Europe has been a real Achilles heel in the European gas market for decades now. And that's something that has been pointed to time and time again. It has sort of driven to some extent the emergence of smaller scale LNG terminals in Poland and the Baltics and the Balkans. But now sort of that urgency to get that done is there. And we are seeing, you know, as you said, in Germany, for instance, a real commitment now to larger scale LNG import facilities. Obviously, though, the horizon of these is a bit longer. So there have to be some kind of interim solution for where to take in LNG, how to improve connectivity, reversing pipelines in order to do that, etc. So I do think there is that bit that still hasn't been entirely worked through by the EU. And there's still a lot of uncertainty about sort of how that plays out in the very near term. So I do think that that's something that's going to be quite problematic. You know, certainly there has been aggressive climate agenda. There was already when the EU green taxonomy was debated just over this past year, there was a lot of resistance to including both gas and nuclear in that definition. Gas has kind of remained in there with some caveats for the time being. I think in light of the Ukraine crisis, there's not really a way around that at the moment. There's a few exemptions it's it's looking at in terms of gas and supply security, and Cyprus is kind of one of those. But I think when they're looking at these, there's always going to be that consideration of if we put the money into sort of some additional projects, interconnectors, pipelines, is there that opportunity that this can continue to be utilized as the energy transition progresses? So for instance, you know, repurposing this for, for hydrogen. And so I think these are really the kinds of issues that strategically, you know, East Med players also have to be thinking about is, are we prepared to kind of make that transition alongside Europe so that we 
we can continue to be a supplier and that these projects aren't developed for five years and then fall off the map again. So I think that's really where there's not a clear answer on how Europe solves its problems in the meantime, in sort of the intervening months to a couple of years. But this is kind of strategically still the long term narrative in Europe. And Colby, I wonder if you could just shed a little bit of light on sort of the Western side, the Algeria situation, what the potential for export to Europe is there. And then if you want to go looking forward and make any sort of assessments about what sort of next generation gas, green hydrogen looks like from any of these exporters. Yeah, absolutely. I think what's interesting about Algeria right now is that we're talking a lot about policy and you know some of the things that the Europeans are going to have to do. What I think can get overlooked a little bit sometimes is some of the work that needs to be done on the commercial side, in addition to some of these policy measures. And without a doubt, Emily certainly just got into some of that as well. But when it comes to Algeria, you know, there, there has been some, some commercial work done. There was a recent agreement with Italy that'll see Algeria export an additional 9 BCM a year. But that also rests on an earlier supply agreement that, that Italy had with Sonatrach, which is Algeria's national oil company. And I mentioned ENI earlier as being one of the, the more active firms in this space so far. And so in that sense, it's important to consider that they're already the largest IOC operator in Algeria. They had previously signed a, a $1.4 billion agreement with Sonatrach to raise production to get involved in some new projects. And, and that agreement came pre-crisis, but it was notable, and I'm mentioning it because it came under the terms of Algeria's new hydrocarbons law, which came into full effect last year. And so one of the questions that I have here, both for right now and looking down the road, is really in terms of IOCs in Algeria, who else wants to join the party? Because the question is really, is, is there a perception that the terms in Algeria combined with this new European need to replace Russian supplies will be too good of an opportunity to pass up. And, and right now, there isn't an answer to that question. As we saw, ENI is already present in Algeria, was already planning new projects, new exploration. Occidental Petroleum, or, or Oxy, is probably the next most likely investor. But it already had plans for, for its assets in Algeria anyway. And let's not forget that Oxy acquired its Algerian assets when it bought Anadarko Petroleum a few years ago and would have sold them to Total Energies had Algiers actually not blocked that sale. So Oxy really didn't even want to be there to begin with and, and is really investing now because it, it seems to have made the determination that it's it's not going to be able to get out of that position. Sonatrack has really a stack of MOUs that has grown enormously large with different IOCs that have expressed interest of one type or another in Algeria. But, but since that new oil law that I mentioned was implemented last year, ENI is really still the only one to sign a new upstream agreement. So I think there's there's an assumption in some cases that that because there's a need here, things are automatically going to happen. And, and there, there are still issues to work out on the commercial end of things and from the perspective of Algiers, both on the policy side as well. 2021 saw domestic uh, natural gas consumption in Algeria grow to more than 50% of production. You know, that's a pretty significant issue if you're trying to raise your exports and you know, secure this sort of long-term, more long-term anyway space as, as a supplier to Europe. Its infrastructure, you know, that, that will only support so much in the way of increased exports. You know, for the moment, pipeline seems to be the, the preferred route for exports. Algeria's LNG capacity is well underutilized, and it doesn't seem as though that trend is going to be reversed soon. So it, it definitely looks like there's going to be a focus on using these pipeline connections, but you know, that's that's really only part of the picture because we have to start to think very seriously about where this added supply comes from in terms of Algeria. On the green hydrogen question, the question with with respect to North Africa more often than not is is how heavily do we expect things to skew in the direction of green hydrogen, which doesn't require natural gas. And I, I think you'll probably see a lot more usage of green. And I, I say that mostly because these producers are going to be targeting European markets and, and green hydrogen, I think, will just be more competitive overall there, even if it may not be quite as competitive with blue hydrogen on a, on a per unit cost basis yet. So while we're talking about Algeria and those existing midstream assets, Emily made a point on on sort of determining how some of these assets get used or repurposed in the long term. And, and that's really one of the main things Algeria is banking on in terms of its ability to become a green hydrogen supplier in the future. It's it's really the pipeline connections it has, as well as its, its very high solar potential, although 
Uh, Algeria at this point, I think, has less than a gigawatt of, of solar capacity, quite a bit less, I believe. I think you brought up some really good points in terms of the the sort of capex situation, like where where do investors really want to be, where do IOCs really want to be in the region, and it's interesting that I think when we look at new investments in green hydrogen, green ammonia, uh, those kind of projects, we're seeing a lot of interest from the Gulf. There was an announcement I think at the end of April that Mazdar will be investing in Egypt in a green hydrogen and green ammonia project project. So. I wonder if you know the future is going to narrow in terms of the investment opportunities and the kinds of players that are willing to get into some not just uncertainty in terms of the regulatory environment in Europe and the kind of export destinations but also in you know in working in these Middle Eastern producers that that have their own kind of regulatory and and political stability hurdles as well. Emily, do you want to comment on on any of that that you're seeing right now? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, from my perspective, obviously, it's not all about the demand signals from Europe, but that still is going to be inevitably a big part of this. And it's hard to imagine, I think, kind of given where our global market dynamics are right now, that final investment decisions are going to be made on, on you know, a number of these projects um, at the moment, just sort of on account of, of supply disruptions in the market. You know, I think the other big thing is that there is a lot of LNG capacity that's coming on market in the years ahead. I think there was about 20% plus of growth expected in LNG supply that was expected to occur between 2020 and 2025. So the next couple of years are really going to be sort of an explosion of additional capacity. And that doesn't really start to decline until, you know, another decade out. So this is where I think it, it's hard to say. Obviously, there's going to be good staying power because of the hard to replace gas uses in, in chemical and industrial sector. I think that could sustain supply, particularly from you know North African countries, for instance, where it can be piped easily to Europe at a cheaper cost than sending LNG. But I think you know we're still really getting into this question that we've sort of kind of touched on repeatedly in, in this discussion: is this ability to transition into into cleaner fuels, into hydrogen, biofuels, etc. So I think you know the appeal is certainly there because of proximity and cost of transport to Europe. But I think it's still very hard to talk about the cost profiles of these projects, whether the demand will be there, whether they're even able to establish, you know, cost effective green hydrogen markets. I think hydrogen as a more global topic is still a bit controversial. So it is sort of this very tough period where investment decisions need to be made, but there's no guarantee whatsoever about the demand prospects or the ability to actually realize this cleaner future for the region. Excellent point. And then that just points to sort of increased uncertainty and instability when we think about where revenue generation will be coming for many of these Middle Eastern producers. I think we might have to leave things there for today. We've reached our, our time limit, but Emily Stromquist and Colby Connolly, thank you so much for joining us on the program. I want to thank our listeners for tuning in and to our production team, to Meredith McCleary for their work on this week's episode. You can follow MEI on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube, and subscribe to our email newsletters for the latest analysis and information about upcoming events. I'm Karen Young. Thank you so much. We'll hear from you and you'll hear from us next week. This has been a presentation of the Middle East Institute. To support MEI's programs and podcasts, please donate at www.mei.edu. Thank you for your support. Thank you.